who is uh, by William Cook, and he's going to be talking about functional programming with structured graphs. Try to switch on the. Um, oh, okay. Um, okay. So we are all functional programmers in this audience. Uh, so we know that functional programming is great to program with trees, right? You know, you have algebraic data types, you have pattern matching, you have equational reasoning. Uh, so with equational reasoning, uh, you can just reason about your functions using algebraic data types and pattern matching. All of this is great. Uh, but what happens if you need to use uh, uh, data structures that have cycles and sharing, essentially graph structures? Well, there are actually a number of things that you can do, of course. Uh, one of them is to just resort to the imperative solution. So you can use mutable references and pointers. Um, and you can model your graphs uh, with pointers. Um, of course, one, one of the things with this is that uh, it's kind of a low-level programming style, so you have to make sure you don't have that many pointers. This is bad for reasoning, so if you break referential transparency. So it's not a, uh, as nice as programming with trees, that's for sure. Um, Another thing that you can do, of course, is to have some form of environments, basically uh, some data structure that uh, tells you uh, about the hedges and uh, the hedges that you have uh, in your nodes, uh, in your graph. Um, and of course the problem with this is that now you have to pass these environments around and uh, have your functions uh, manipulate and manage these environments, so it's also not uh, very good, there's a lot of work that you need to do. Um, finally, another solution, especially if you're using uh, languages like, like Haskell, uh, is that you can exploit call by need to actually create cyclic structures. Um, and this works very nicely, except that you cannot uh, really manipulate these structures. It's very hard to preserve sharing, and you can certainly not observe it in a purely functional way. So uh, you would have to uh, kind of uh, look at the pointer structure to actually uh, compare the pointers and figure out where the sharing is. Okay, so people have thought about this problem and uh, they have tried to come up with solutions for this problem. For example, uh, there's actually uh, one idea that, go back, that goes back to Tim Shearer's work uh, with uh, Fegaris. And uh, this, this idea is that you can uh, uh, explicitly uh, model cycles and sharing uh, with uh, recursive binders. Uh, and then you use this idea to observe the binders. Uh, typically you do this by using pattern matching. And what this allows you to do um, is that now you can uh, essentially observe where the, the everything is and you can define functions that preserve sharing, for example. Uh, but one important question is, uh, how do you translate this idea into practice? So how, how do you actually uh, uh, come up with implementations of this idea? And the difficulty here is to, to find essentially a good encoding for uh, recursive binders that is practical, uh, expressive, and flexible. Uh, many people have worked on, on uh, this idea, but there are always one limitation or another limitation you, that you have to use some kind of encodings that is not very practical, that is very heavy, or the approach is not uh, very expressive, so you cannot express certain kinds of edges. So there, are, there have always been some limitations. So what we propose in this work um, is uh, um, uh, a new twist to this whole idea, which is to use parametric OS. Uh, a parametric core is a representation of binders. And the advantage of this parametric core representation of binders is that it combines a number of features that makes it very nice to program uh, with these graph structures. In particular, you have well scopedness, typically you don't have to manage environments, and it's also quite expressive in the types of functions that you can write, and also widely applicable. So uh, it works in, in many different types of languages including Arda or Cox. So, for example, some other uh, OS representations will not work in those languages. 
Um, so, let's start by reviewing uh, Parametric OS and what it is about. Um, so, par Parametric OS, um, so here we have an example of a Lambda Calculus with some extensions and um, um, the basic idea is that you have a data type that is uh, P lambda that represents the type of expressions that is parameterized by a type A. Um, and this type is the type of your variables. Um, and you use it in the binding constructors. In particular, you use it in the variable case. Um, so in, in the variable case, what you have is you take a value of this type um, and you also use it in the lambda case. The, in the lambda case, what you do is you you have a constructor that takes a function, and this function is a function whose input is a value of type A and whose output is another expression. Uh, what is important to note about this representation is that uh, this uh, type A here is meant to be used parametrically when you construct the terms. That means you should not instantiate it. And to enforce this, you use another type that uses universal quantification to make sure that all uses of these uh, A's are universally quantified, so you cannot instantiate it with concrete types. Um, and just a, a, a quick word on notation, these two up and down arrows here are just the embedding projections that simply uh, construct or extract the values of type P lambda. So this is just some asshole. <laughs> but um, so with the parametric words representation, as I said, you can avoid constructing some junk terms uh, and essentially prevent uh, terms that would not be valid closed lambda terms. Uh, so one, one of them is this one here. In here, what you're trying to do is try to instantiate the type A to an integer, but of course this is going to be uh, rejected by the type system because you're trying to instantiate the type parameter. So the key idea is really that if you want to use variables, then all these variables need to be uh, generated from one of these lambda constructors and by using uh, uh, one uh, variable of the meta language here. Um, so you can use this idea to uh, model recursive binders and uh, recursive binders work uh, very much in the same way as uh, the lambda construct constructors for the lambda calculus. So for example, if we wanted to extend our lambda calculus with uh, recursive functions, one way to do it would be to have a new constructor new, which again takes a function uh, from A to P lambda A, and um, the way you interpret this function, uh, for example, if you want to uh, uh, create an evaluation function or interpretation function for the lambda calculus, is you give it a fixed point uh, semantics, essentially. So uh, basically, you take the, the fixed point of the composition of evaluation and the function that you're trying to uh, define the curve. Um, and one of the things you could do easily with this is, for example, define the factorial function. So to define the factorial function, you could define it just by using uh, these uh, recursive binders. So you bind uh, a recursive function f, and then basically you use the f uh, in the position of the recursive calls. Um, okay, so, so this is the basic construction that we need to uh, now start modeling our cyclic structures. Um, and to give you a, a quick example, let, let's suppose you want to model a form of cyclic streams. And uh, these streams are inductive uh, in the sense that they, uh, they, you can only have finite representations, but the interpretations are infinite. So for example, you can capture uh, streams that have a, a repetition pattern, like 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. So you can finitely represent this stream, but the interpretation is infinite. 
Um, so you could also have a co-inductive uh, interpretation as well if you wanted. But anyway, the idea to model this data type is that uh, you create a data type P-stream that has two arguments, a V and an A. The V argument is essentially the parametric OS uh, type. Uh, and then you have the two parametric OS constructors, uh, the variables and mu. Uh, and finally, you also have the cons constructor for streams, the standard cons constructor. So it takes one element of type A and takes another stream. And then, of course, you apply the, the uh, trick of using the universal quantification to prevent bad uses. And now, uh, you can just model uh, a cyclic stream with uh, these data types. So, for example, here the stream 1, 2 uh, that infinitely repeats would be modeled using a uh, constructed mu that binds this variable v. And then you have two uses of cons, and finally, you use the variable to um, tie up the cycle. Um, so, what, what kind of operations can you define on these uh, streams? So, one type of operation that you can define is, is a fold-like operation, for example. Uh, so, this is like a, like a fold on trees, oh, on uh, lists. Uh, so, it's, it's basically the same signature. So, you have a, a function that deals with the const case, and you also have uh, a second argument that with lists would be used for dealing with the empty case, but in here uh, is actually going to be used to... Um, so the, the variable case is going to, to play the role of the empty case. So you, uh, the idea is that you use the k here uh, and pass it to this function g, and what this function g does is essentially substitutes k in all in the variable positions. Um, and one of the things that you could define is something that uh, computes the elements out of one of these uh, cyclic streams. For example, for the stream 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, you compute 1, 2. Um, another operation that you could do is a variation of these folds, uh, which is a cyclic fold. Um, and so, what what this cyclic fold does, differently from the previous one, is that now instead of having, uh, instead of replacing all the variables with a constant, uh, what you do is that you pass to this function g the fixed point of the function itself. So by passing this fixed point, you can create a, a cyclic structure as the output. For example, you can you can define a two-list function that from a string computes the infinite list representation of that string. Um, okay, perhaps more interestingly, you can also define uh, operations that third sharing, and, and this is one of the key difficulties when uh, working in call by need languages, um, is, is that typically it's very hard to define functions that preserve sharing. And uh, for example, one of the operations that you could Define is that a map function for streams that just takes uh, a function from A to B and from a stream of A's computes a stream of B's, but it preserves the same sharing structure as, as the original stream. And uh, the reason why you can do this is because you can pattern match on the binding structure and reconstruct that binding structure on the output. Um, you can uh, take this idea further. And, uh, for example, the, the kind of uh, binding structures that you have on, on streams is very basic, but you can take this idea further and uh, allow very expressive forms of uh, hedges between your structures. For example, if you want to model trees, then, of course, you can do more than just having back hedges. Um, so, um, in order to model these more expressive structures, the, the idea is simply to uh, have a slight modification on the new constructor, uh, and instead of just taking a v to a p tree of v of a's, what you do is you take a list of variables, and you can compute a list of uh, expressions or trees uh, as, as the output. And this allows you to um, model uh, structures like this one here, um, where you can have cross 
links between the two trees that you are defining. So, so this uh, list here defines two, two trees simultaneously, and uh, these trees have links between themselves. So, so it's kind of a use of mutual recursion. If you want to think in terms of binders, uh, this is like comparable to having let rec. When you have a let rec in a language like Haskell or ML, so you can have mutual references uh, everywhere. So you can uh, write a data structure uh, whose uh, like first element is one, and then as the second element, you have the second uh, tree, and this second tree refers back to the uh, original root. Um, anyway, there's a lot more in the paper. So in here, I've just tried to show you the basic idea. But uh, one of the nicest things about this representation is that because it's purely functional, you can actually just use conventional reasoning techniques to reason about the functions that, that you're writing. So you can use uh, induction. So uh, another advantage of this representation is that it offers you a lot of flexibility on, on the choice of fixed points. So you, you can use the fixed point uh, computations that uh, are embedded in Haskell, but you can also define your own fixed point combinators. For example, this is useful to deal with operations that require left recursion. Um, finally, you can uh, also uh, take this idea to a generic level and actually provide a generic representation of binding uh, and also generic operations on these uh, uh, cyclic structures, uh, and to show uh, all of our results, we uh, essentially provided a case study with grammars, so we can have uh, you have operations like new mobility and normalization. So please check the paper if you wanna see more details about this approach. Um, anyway, to conclude, I think uh, with uh, structured graphs, we get a fairly high level programming model that deals with uh, cycles, so you can actually program with cyclic structures. And uh, because it's purely functional, you can just use standard uh, reasoning techniques. Thank you very much.